like a bit of football. I want to leave some time and space for National League. So let's just kind of roll through some of these football ferns or white things a bit quicker. Football ferns, did you learn anything new from their series in Chile? Like, yeah, we know the situation. You couldn't watch the second game, the logistics, all this stuff. We've talked of, we've covered some really detailed stuff on Monday and across all our content. Did you learn anything new? See, I've been trying to find a way to attack the article that I'm going to write about this. I think the reason it's so difficult to to come up with just an intro, to come up like my, um, not, I don't mean intro as in like the first paragraph, I mean the intro as in like how do I get myself into this headspace to get, find a flow for the article. I think the reason is that the answer to your question is no. I'm not sure we did learn anything new about the football fans. It's the same thing where they've, you know, They've been in a difficult spot. They start the series poorly. They get better in the second game, even though by the sounds of it, they actually you know made quite a few changes for the second game, performed a lot better, which makes you wonder why they had so much trouble in the first game. Like um, I did mention when we talked about that on Monday, I do think that was an instance where, um, yeah, where Yitka Yitka Kim Clover has had a lot of pressure because of the results and I think a lot of that hasn't really been her fault I do think she's got a cop for the first game because the tactics just didn't work uh, but I talked about that on Monday but the the fact is like some of those things are trends they the fact they often the first game of a series is worse than the next game in a, in a tour that's something that's been a recurring theme I'll try to break that down a little bit more because I, I want to see just how much that is true but then the other thing is like Whenever the football ferns get these stink ass results, there's a it's the same thing that's true all the time is that they're always missing key players. And when they when they roughed it up against Chile in the first game, one of the disappointing things there was that I actually like their their defense was first choice and their defense was struggling. So I was surprised by that. I've, including Vic Hessen, I thought it's the worst i've seen her play for quite a while for the football fir- like the worst i've seen her play full stop for the football ferns because she's basically been brilliant every time she's played for the national team until that game i think that's one where she was not at her best um and you know you can make cases about players being in pre-season or early season and not being in prime form or world cup hangovers and stuff like that um but the other factor that you have with there is they did like they could have been one nil up in that first game. Like they had a couple of nice chances. They started all right the first twenty minutes when they had the ball in the Chilean half. They were fine. It was when Chile pressed them and against their defense where they struggled because their midfield was not set up to be able to withstand that. So their defense didn't have any options. So the defense is giving the ball away. That's inviting pressure. Basically, all the Chile goals came from turnovers in their own half. And there you go. Um, but they could if they'd scored first and been one nil up who knows, but like Gabby Rennie missed a couple of chances and there you go. And why is Gabby Rennie playing? Um, Gabby Rennie's playing because Olivia Chance isn't fit. Olivia Chance isn't fit. Neither is uh, Jackie Hand, apparently, even though she's been playing club football and Rhea Percival wasn't available because she's still, um, you know, getting back to a hundred percent for, from her, from her knee injury and these kind of things. Like the football friends can't afford to miss key players. Because the players they have to call up can't do as well, and if the, the if they're not putting their best eleven out there, then you know, well, we've seen even when they have their best eleven, they still can't score goals very well. So, imagine what it's like when you take out probably the two most creative players they've had in the last couple. What well, live chance over the last four years has been their most creative player. I'd say Jackie Hand over the last six months has been their best creative player. Uh, that's that's quite a significant blow, and unfortunately. Like, I was shocked. I was updating my spreadsheets and stuff with some footy ferns, um, trying to keep counts of lineups and stuff so I can, so I'm aware of these trends. I've been doing this for ages, but I was updating them. Um, shocked to realize Gabby Rennie's now got 30 caps. Like, she's still at college in the USA, and I like Gabby Rennie a lot as a player. She was a real good prospect, um, for Canterbury coming up playing, uh, under 17s for New Zealand. She shouldn't have 30 caps. Like she's not even in a professional environment yet, and she hasn't even been a regular starter throughout her college career. She shouldn't be playing that regular where she's getting games every single time. I do think there's a little bit of a... I mean, you can make a similar case for Paige Satchel to a little bit lesser extent, because Satchel's shown a little bit more, but um, still is someone who, like, 
the end product's not there and we're desperate for end product. And the Phoenix just got rid of Satchel at a time where they're trying to find out how to score better goals. Football firms are still leaning on players like Satchel and Rennie who are good players and who will deserve to, have deserved opportunities. They've just maybe gotten too many opportunities. And I wonder if it's just time only really in the attacking third um, and she might bring Hannah Wilkinson into this as well. I'm not sure. I think she does lose a bit of um, a bit of goodwill for getting sent off in that in the first Chilean game. I thought that was rather unacceptable. Um, that's, you know, I, I, I wonder if it's, a, if it's time for a little bit of a shakeup and maybe we've seen that because there are players already like Indy Riley, Millie Clegg now I think on this tour it's one the probably the only player who, who um, improved her standings, um, but Indy Riley certainly did the World Cup. I think Grace Jala has always been deserving of a more prominent role than she's been allowed to, and I think they should try her as a centre forward. Um, Jackie Hand obviously is very good, and they right now as it stands, the Football Ferns one of their biggest problems is that the elite level depth is not good enough to where they just to where they can drop players. Um, who are out of form. It's getting there because it happened with Michaela with Michaela Moore for the World Cup. Um, that's in defense, though. Like, we've got a lot of options in defense. I should mention Claudia Bunger is another player who didn't partake in any of these games. Is another She might not be first 11, but if she's not, she's 12th. You know, <laughs> it's only because we've got two really good center backs. Um, it hasn't really been the case, certainly not in attacking areas, though, where they've just had to keep picking the same project players over and over because there just isn't anyone where if they're not playing well, we drop them because someone else is commanding a better opportunity. The stuff we could talk, like, stuff similar to what you're saying about Kiwi's depth, and they can pick an, an A team that's good enough to beat most international teams, you know? Um, a team with players who were all competing for first-team things. A Football Ferns A team wouldn't look like that yet, um, but it's not that far away. Like the, that depth is coming. It, it is on the way. And honestly, to some extent, it might arrive as soon as next month when the next A-League season kicks off because there is a, a little influx of, of attacking depth in particular coming in the A-League next time. And, you know, Devin Jackson, Ruby Nathan, um, Hannah Blake is another player. Maggie Jenkins, I think, is coming into her last year of college. She's someone who, once she gets out of the college system, which will be towards the end of the A-League season, she could pop up in the way that Hannah Blake did last year with Perth. Um, there's, let alone Phoenix Academy players pushing through as well. You know, there's there is depth coming. It's not there yet, and it needs to be nurtured at a professional level before it can like be commanding international stuff. But yeah, unfortunately, what we're seeing from the football firms is still the lingering effects of uh, the previous way of doing things. So I, we might just have to ride that out for a little bit until until the cavalry arrives. Basically, is the, the the issue there? So no, I didn't learn anything from them, but I'm still encouraged about the direction they can be on. It's just. They're not there yet, you know? Well, it's the start of a World Cup cycle. Like they're, This is where new players emerge. This is where you give those opportunities to different players to, like, the football fans don't need to yeah. win games right now. They need to win major tournament games. They need to score goals at major tournaments, Olympics, World Cups. An away series in Chile where one of the games wasn't broadcasted, that's not the time to really be showcasing all your razzle dazzle. You know, it's just the time to put a few building blocks down and keep it moving, keep on trucking into the flying Kiwis rounds where most of those players will return. Yeah, and I hope that is what happens because um, there is. Yeah, you know, that's what I'm saying about maybe the attacking areas in particular need just a little bit of a shake up, and now is the time to start giving some of those other. And we did see some of that, so that is encouraging. Like Millie Clegg started the second game. Um, a few of those extra options, it's like let's just see what we can do because we know it's what we've got at the moment and how we've been doing this is not good enough. So it's good, but it's not good enough. And we see that whenever they play against better teams, it's like that you need to at least give yourself something and looking for maybe a little bit of just searching for some x factor in some players and there are there are a few who might be able to do that kind of stuff and maybe now is when you have to begin to think about that because 
they can't they can't just stay doing the same thing which we know only works up to a certain level and that level is not where they're aiming to be or, which is winning major tournament games like that's that's the issue but yeah like i said on monday maybe this will be a little bit of a shake up because we did see some of that i'd like to see them lean a little bit more further into that but for the most part that chile the first chilean game or well, both these chilean games because it's conceded five goals but for the most part defensively they're good great crop of goalkeepers midfield's all right it's just that attack in third you know a lot of the a lot of the blocks are there we also had an all whites squad named by the savior of New Zealand football, Darren Baisley. Uh, they will play games He's against... Meister. Some call him the Baysmeister. <laughs> right. um, Do they? <laughs> that's what One he has. Said. Um, they play Congo, the Democratic Republic, maybe, of Congo, Dr. Congo, mm -hmm. and they also play the All Whites in England. Be very interesting to see what happens again. It's, uh, no, they play Australia, sorry. They are the All Whites. That's they play the against Australia and England. Given that there was a corresponding fixture in New Zealand, I think it was late last year. Um, yeah, September-ish. So they now have a couple of games against Australia as a measuring stick. We won't go too deep into this, but we did touch on the inclusions of Tyler Binden from Reading and old mates Matt Dibley-Diaz from Fulham. We did touch on that in the subscriber podcast, so you, and I'm sure there'll be, uh, you'll write about it, you'll drop a lot more information. Are there any, like, I was interested because they are the only two dudes with zero caps in the squad. And they are both, it's not like uh, they're ho-hum New Zealand football prospects. Like, they are as we discussed in the subscriber podcast, major recruitment wins for New Zealand football and all whites football. So that's bon That's a bonus. Um, you got Sapri Singh's back in there. We just had an Elijah Just goal, which was Razzle Dazzle. He's there. Old mate Joey C, Joey Champness, musical extraordinaire. He's back in the mix. Step over God. So shout out to him. Um, those are like my highlights for what it's worth. What's kind of one or two pockets that you're really interested in, especially with the um, the Flying Kiwis context around it? Yeah, I would say that, well, you know what? I think the, the highlight of the squad isn't so much a specific player uh, as it is just because we've just talked about that football fern stuff. It's the fact that, um, you know, Exactly what the football ferns aren't yet able to do, the All Whites are, because they're just a couple years further ahead on the same same trajectory, just a couple years further ahead. The All Whites have just picked a squad that has no A-League players in it. And they've done it on purpose because they're saying these guys are um, you know, late in their preseason, they're not match fit, but they are sort of like, well, and also it would disrupt flying over to Europe and then back right before week one of the season would disrupt their potential availability for their clubs at that point. Um, they just decided it was the, the easiest thing to do not to pick those guys and just be like, well, we'll come back. You guys come back into contention for the November win window. But for this one, we're just going to focus on European and American-based players. Um, and they have, and it's still a good squad. You know, they're not really going to miss those A-League guys too much. There's a bit of depth, sure, but th there's other depth that's available in other positions from, uh, I mean, from other, you know, parts of the world, just Kiwi players being around. Like, And that also op does open up the, the room for Dibley Diaz and Binden to not just be in the squad, but probably to get debuts as well. Like, that factor is the thing that stands out the most, is that they can just not pick A-League players. The football fans wouldn't have a team if they didn't pick A-League players, you know? Who from the A-League is better than the players selected there? I wouldn't agree with this personally, but there is a case of Oli Sale as starting goalkeeper. I think Clayton Lewis is not in the first 11, but he might be pushing, like, popping up off the bench for the last 15 minutes kind of territory. But I don't know that he's particularly better than, like... I mean, that bench might have... Callum McCoward and Eli Just on it, you know, in which case, no, Lewis wouldn't be playing ahead of them. It just depends on like formations and where guys go. But 
Um, the the main one would probably be Tim Payne at right back is I think probably our best right back. But I don't think you know. We'll see what Nico Cohen's look like looks like because I haven't seen a lot of him since he came back from his knee injury. But he seems to he seems to be going all right. He captained Padova a couple weeks ago. That's third tier in Italy, so it's not amazing. But he is one of the better. They are one of the better teams in third tier in Italy. Uh, should be pushing for promotion this year again. He's you know that's your backup. That's not too bad. I I will say that depth might get tested a little more because I. Don't McGarry's been picked. James McGarry's been recalled. Don't really think he's going to make it because he's got a hamstring injury at the moment. Tommy Smith sounds like he'll be okay. Matt Garbett sounds like he'll be okay. Bill Toeloma sounds like he'll be okay. But those guys have been dealing with injuries. Um, but at the same time, if we're talking about depth, I mean, it's not like everyone, like Brian Thomas isn't there either. Like there's, there's still that potential to, to come. Um, but no, they're, they're not really going to miss the A-League players. And that's the, that's the best. Let's also... You know, this is a couple steps down the line, but that's also where the football firms want to get to. It's like you can pick the A League players, sure, but you pick the ones who are in form and really doing well, like how Australia does. You know, there are a couple A League players, men's and women's teams for them usually, but they're the superstar standouts. It's not the solid job doers of the A League. Like you, we want solid job doers in the English Super League or in the English Premier League or whatever, you know. We want those guys, the solid job doers, they make our national teams no dramas. The solid job doers in Australia, not not so much. Um great depth for the country, but not necessarily for the national team. And that's the foot the the football firms aren't there yet. The all whites are there, which is beautiful. Like this is actually a step forward for the team in that way. Like this is a, a new um a new development. And that's without you know I didn't see Logan Rogerson there, Ollie White. There are other professionals who aren't in these, like Jamie Searle as a goalkeeper too, you know. There's other guys who could be there that aren't. It's not like they've picked all of the European players. They've still been able to, without picking A-League dudes, still been able to balance it a little bit towards form and fitness too. And, um, you know, Dalton Wilkins is someone who I think might has a good chance to come in if McGarry is ruled out. Like, that's there's more where this came from, you know. Let's get into National League. We'll finish our niche cast today with National League football. I'm just going to, I got questions. So I'll just ask questions. You can fire off an answer and we'll keep it moving. Um, yeah, love it. The So the winners in the men's National League, we are Wellington Olympic, Napier City, Auckland United, Auckland City, Christchurch United. Women's winners from last weekend, we got Western Springs, Wellington Phoenix, Auckland United, Western Eastern Suburbs. And then the two capital teams or two central teams, as you said, on Monday, the CF, they had a draw. My first question, what's the difference between Christchurch United and Canterbury United? Oh, well, Christchurch United is a club and Canterbury United is a federation team. So Canterbury United, which only exists now on the women's side of things, but there used to be a Canterbury United and the men's team back when they had federation teams there as well. Um, Canterbury United Pride is a, a fed team they're selecting from a bunch of clubs. Christchurch United is just one club that exists as their own thing, top to bottom. Um, they are a well-funded team, though. Like They're the so, dominant force in Canterbury men's but, football. Is their Rosh, Russian oligarch overlord guy, does he fund Canterbury football as well, or is it just Christchurch United? I don't think so. I think it's just the club. But, I mean, they... They have now the best functioning academy probably in the whole of the South Island. So yeah, there's he's he's funding it in an indirect way. Like they're developing players, but it's it's through Christchurch United the club. But yeah. some some of the younger female players or some of the female players in Canterbury United, they might be playing women's football for Christchurch United. Uh, no. Not the good ones. Uh, maybe the young ones. I'm not sure what their women's team is like, but they're not, and they weren't in the South Island League. So, in the women's side, you still got like um, Kashmir Techs. Women's team is very good. Coastal Spirits very good. Then the like Dunedin City Royals are also good in the South Island. Those are probably the dominant forces. I don't know where Christchurch United are. I would imagine they're building up towards that. But for for now, it seems mostly on the men's side. Uh, but so, that, is a, that is a club with a lot of history. Like they were winning Chatham Cups in the 70s and 80s. So the, because you have talked about this a few times, the the hub, the um, kind of, and this applies to NRL as well, like the wave of football in the Canterbury region, as you said, kind of funded and overseen by 
a very generous Russian geezer, but he hasn't really taken that into women's football yet. So there might be a next wave where that really yeah. flows into women's football in that region as well. Um, more so. So the winners in the women's competition, Western Springs are there, Auckland United's there, Eastern Suburbs is there. I, like it is timely, there is that chat about the Auckland A-League team and all three of those teams are in Auckland. I've only had one win, so it's nothing notable, but are there like any bigger links or any bigger context to each of those teams? Are they affiliated with any bigger organization or is it just kind of three teams in Auckland? You got the west side, you got the east side, which isn't how it's framed at all. And then you've got Auckland United um, as well. Yeah. Um, so Eastern Springs, East, Eastern Suburbs is pretty eastern. Western Springs is, you know, Western Springs. So it's only yeah. the start of the west. It gets a lot wester than that. Um, west Coast Rangers they, would be the dominant. They certainly yeah. aren't. But it is. They certainly aren't west side or east side, you know. They're eastern suburbs and western yeah. springs. And... It's like Koimarama. <laughs> it's a nice a nice coastal breeze, I think I mentioned. And it looked Grayland, like in that you know, eastern like... suburbs game. Yeah, and Grayland. <laughs> Anyone outside Auckland, Koimarama, Grayland, western springs area, very affluent suburbs in Auckland. Yeah, and, uh, you know, um, who, who are Auckland United is like... Um, that that's general general central auckland that's like uh like former central united no um former three kings and uh only hunger sports so it's, it's like of south of the central um you know keith a park is where they play it's that's a massive it's like 18 grounds there and they've got football hockey and all sorts and um that's where they're based so that's <laughs> and then ellerslie is a little bit you know, similar region, a little bit further south from that. Yeah, but um, they, is there any bigger affiliation to those three teams? No, but they don't need them. I mean, you, you could say so in the terms of Auckland United and that they are a merger club. Like I have mentioned that, you know, Three Kings only hung a uh, connection there. Um, so that there's that. Like there, that is a com combination, a recent merger of two clubs. Uh Eastern suburbs and and especially Western Springs, they don't have bigger affiliations necessarily. Like they don't have anyone pumping things in from some other football club or anything. But definitely Western Springs is borderline the biggest club in the country. I, I would argue uh, it's in the most popular city and it's potentially the biggest club in um in in Auckland just in terms of like total members like teams entered in leagues from the uh from the most social of the social right up to the highest competitive level that club is huge you're huge you got a lot of subs coming in a lot of subs coming in you got money and if you got money you got power so they, i think they're they're sort of their own thing and then eastern suburbs not quite as big but still fairly big and um yeah very affluent part of the part of the country is where that club is based. So I would imagine you get some, uh, but then at the same time, like from what I understand, Minyuri has got some, like uh, they, they've got a few. Um, do we call them wealthy benefactors? I don't know. Like there's, there's uh, members who are putting money into the club to help. Yeah, they them. all, they like, all that's, have that. that's across yeah, the board. Yeah, Everyone yeah. has that. So, but, but there's no yeah, greater there's... affiliation to any professional academy or anything. No, other than their own. But as I say, like they, their academies are still pretty good because those are big yeah, clubs. Yeah. Who is better, Canterbury United or Southern United for the woman? Just to we'll find that out. Yeah, we'll we find will. that out. Um, but it's hard your... to say right now. But traditionally, it's Canterbury United. Last year, it looked like Southern for a bit, but Canterbury came home strong. I think Canterbury might be a little bit weaker than that, and I was really impressed by it. I thought Southern were going to quite struggle. Uh, if you asked me a week ago, I'd have said Canterbury all day, but um, it'll be an interesting one to follow is which of those teams, because Central are coming last, don't worry about that, um, but which one of the other two Fed teams finishes higher than the other, same as who finishes higher out of those two capital teams, the Waterside Karori and Wellington United. I, to be safe, probably still going to say Canterbury in terms of the Canterbury Southern thing, but I was impressed by Southern. I think they got a really good defense thing, even though they've lost a lot of players, they've maintained a good spine from from last year to this year, 
And Amy Hislop gives them a, a number nine option, um, which I think everyone needs that is that just a, a goal scoring striker who can hold the ball up and bring the, like drag their team forward uh, further up the field. Something that maybe Southern lacked last year and they have it now. So there's potential for them. I don't know that there's crazy depth if key players get injured there, but their first 11 is going to be competitive with anyone. Except maybe those Auckland teams. And you said central. But they are different to the Central Football Wellington United and Central Football Waterside Karori. Well, it, it's Capital Football for them, but it's the Central oh, League, if that makes yeah, yeah, sense. Yeah, sorry, I, the logo looks like it's Central, but it is Capital. My bad, my bad, yeah. my bad. Um, who's the best player? Because in... Central League is a combination of the Central Region yeah. and the Capital Region, so yeah. Who's the best players to watch out for in the women's team early doors? From Korean Wellington United or just no, across the, the league? league okay, yeah. across the whole league. Um, uh, well, Taylor O'Brien is the reigning MVP for Eastern Suburbs, so there's that, but she didn't play in the first round. Um, I would say, uh, like, best of the best, uh, we're talking, like, just yeah, the just elite players, the players, standouts. Yeah. It is, it is it's 10 teams and a lot of, you know, a lot of good players and a lot of good positions. Um, Eastern suburbs and Western Springs feel like the feel like the best teams right now. I know Auckland United won the won the thingy the regional league, but I think suburbs and springs where you've got like suburbs, you know, Taylor O'Brien and um I think Saki Yoshida is a fantastic player for them. They got some good forwards, Nicole Medham, um uh, Nicole Cooper as well. Zoe Benson is a youngster to, to keep an eye out who could have a big season. So they're they're pretty well stacked. Western Springs, looking at like Lily Jervis at the back. Um, American goalkeeper Mickey Mitchell seems pretty handy. They also got an American striker, Sofia Garcia, one of the best. Sounds like they've got their Japanese players back from last year as well. Rina Hirano and Arisa Takeda, who are fantastic, but spent the year. They went overseas and I think they played in Canada. Um, but apparently they're coming back for the summer season. So that's cool. Um, Lara Colpi is someone in that same under 20s age group as as Zoe Benson, who's a really talented player. Um, there's, there's a lot to look for. I, I've enjoyed, because I've watched Western Springs a couple of times because they were also in the Channel Cup final. And I have I like the look of Tiana Hill as a fullback who's from the Waikato region, used to play in... She actually played in the, with Hamilton Wanderers in the, in the what do you call it? Um, the, uh, the Kate Shepard Cup final two three three times ago it was started last year but it was the 2021 version that was a hamilton wanderers squad that also had uh michaela foster was in that team um Maniah elliott who's now with the wellington phoenix uh, chelsea elliott who's playing for uh auckland united um I think Riley Godball might have been their goalkeeper who's played under 20s for New Zealand. She's playing the thing. I was just, I was noticing that team recently because I was looking at some of the, where some of these Phoenix players coming from and noticing just how like, I think women's football in general, there's some strong players coming out of that uh, Waikato region and none of them play for the Waikato teams anymore. <laughs> it's the wet part, but there's more coming through because Laura Bennett was, I think, player of the tournament at the under 16. She's from Melville. So you did mention like 10 players there. Taylor O'Brien is a notable one. That's one I'm going to be watching out for because you for did sure. say she was amazing last season. And the wing back you just said from the Waikato Tiana region, Hill. Tiana Hill. I like it. For the men who are trying to narrow it down, just give us like two or three players just to for folks to watch out for. Like you're the National League expert from Aotearoa. So who do you think are the best players in the men's National League right now? Well, if you want me to narrow this down, I'm not going to pick an Auckland City or a Wellington Olympic player because you could go through basically their starting 11s and some of their benches and just pick class players from top to bottom there. So outside of those two, Garvin Coughlin for sure, Irish striker for Kashmir Technical, is as good as anyone in the country. He creates goals, he scores goals, he's brilliant. Uh, Francis de Vries, Playing left back for Eastern Suburbs, of course, a recently capped all white player and just coming back from a knee injury. So he spent the he spent the year getting his reps in at Eastern Suburbs. That's a big shout. Um, I'm increasingly becoming a very big fan of Matt Todd Smith for Christchurch United in the midfield. I think he's fantastic. And also, if you're watching Christchurch United, definitely 
pay attention to their uh their stick both both Kiwi dudes as well as strike force of Sam Phillip, who's ex Wellington Phoenix uh, Academy, went over to college in the states and has come back and was top scorer in the Southern League, and also Eddie Wilkinson, who was real good for them last year, but then went and spent the winter season playing in Australia. Now he's back. Eddie Wilkinson scored an unreal goal on the weekend for them to beat Eastern Suburbs. He's just think about him the way you think about like a point guard on basketball who doesn't pass but shoots all the time. You know, one of those guys who just, you know how they talk about creating their own shot in basketball. That's what Eddie Wilkinson does. It's just, he gets the ball. He's so good at dribbling. He always finds space to get the shot away. And he's pretty good when he gets the shot away as well. And that's why he's scoring key goals like he did uh, in that in that big one against Suburbs. Mandatory Wellington Phoenix check-in as we wrap up here. They There was a signing Supic, young young. Yeah, What's Luke Supic, younger Supic. brother of Adam Supic, who also went through the academy and I think is at Eastern Suburbs now. Is he going to be playing for the Wellington Phoenix Reserves and or any other notable? Because the Wellington Phoenix men, they are making a habit of signing a lot of their local academy kind of players. Are they all in this reserves team? Is it just a couple? Like, what's the breakdown there? Well, they didn't have any contracted players in week one. We'll see what that looks like down the line because when they're... When the season starts in three or four weeks for the for the next, then maybe there'll be players who get released because they're not in the match day squad at the moment. It seems like they just want everyone training and because they didn't sign anyone from outside the club except for a couple backups from Newcastle. That's taken a lot of the depth out of the um, academy team. But the academy team was still pretty good on the weekend. I, I, I'm super impressed, especially by their defense. Um Holding out Auckland City to just a, a one nil defeat was pretty solid, but yeah, I don't, I don't know how much we'll see those guys play for the reserves. That's something I'm, I'm keeping a close eye on because I was hoping to get a good look at Luke Supic, and hopefully still will, but because he's 17 years old, he, I think he was the top scorer or equal top scorer with someone from one of the other countries at the Oceania Under 17s. Seems like a genuine goal scorer, like a striker who scores goals. Um, just had the, the knack for scoring goals, putting the ball in the back of the net, the way that I don't think the Phoenix Academy has had since Ben Wayne. And so I was pretty curious by like the outputs there. He'd been playing a few Central League games. He's he's good. He's He would be playing here if he wasn't a senior contract. I think maybe they will be keeping him around the first team pitcher though. But we'll see. My, uh, like I would like to see them release a few players now and then to get some reps in at this level because we did see it from the women, like Emma Main, Mackenzie Barry, plus two of their scholarship players, Zoe McMeekin and Manaya Elliott. Um, they all played for the for the women on the weekend. So maybe the men's team who usually do that, but we'll see because, as I say, the squad is smaller and much more internal than it has been in the past. And that's probably something we should talk about in the future. But it's uh, maybe... That's a big conversation that all uh, that direction of that team is you know, too big of a conversation to fit in the last few seconds of this podcast. The similarities between the Warriors and the Phoenix, they are increasingly... It's definitely heavy. something I want to talk about at some point. Yeah. 